Firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Dubai Civil Defence and the organisers of the event for allowing me to speak today. Um, I do actually feel quite proud to be stood on stage. Um, you know, I think this presentation will actually be more of a case study of what I've seen in my 4.3 4 years in Dubai. Um, I can talk on one slide all afternoon, but it would be good to follow the actual presentation slides. <coughs> Um, but interestingly enough, as part of the research for the, um, for the presentation, there's one particular event in the UK that um, I'd like to bring the, the attention of the audience. And it's the first time it's actually happened that the, the Home Office have actually instigated a full statutory inspection of one of the fire authorities, which is the Avon Fire and Rescue Authority. Now, obviously, I think the proof, proof of the pudding for any fire authority is the operational delivery of firefighting actions. But there are five key areas that are under investigation. And this will be about a three month investigation and obviously it will be ongoing, but we'll probably make a very good case study when the findings are out. But the five areas that we've been looked at were spending, contracts, complaints, discipline and culture. No reference to operational delivery. But it's interesting looking at the, or listening to the earlier presenters about culture, discipline, and leadership. And certainly what I've seen in my time in Dubai is good, solid leadership from Dubai Civil Defense. I've seen the policies, strategic planning, implementation and operation, auditing from management, improvements, the management review, and the cycles closed by looking at the policy. And it's very inspiring to see the Re, uh, the, the renewal of the Fire and Life Safety Code, which I think is a great enhancement. So that was my ad-libbing. Now back to the slides. Today I'm trying to put over a, a, you know, a global perspective for fire engineering, look at the challenges of the UAE, and I think this is where the case study is, is always ongoing. Operational efficiency, the keys to success, what are the key factors? I'm looking at accredited audits and peer review. I think within the fire engineering and design community, it is very important to liaise directly with the civil defense authorities and the key, key stakeholders. We can make great improvements together, and I think it's, again, I'm, I'm proud to be sat, uh, stood in front of an audience of expertise and knowledge, and I think together at these forums, we can make, uh, make the UAE and Dubai a safer place. So with the case study, I, I do like to see the pictures of Dubai. So we're looking at the marina here. But if, if we took out the 100 dirham note, we would see Sheikh Rashid Tower, the first tall building in Dubai in 1979. Now, 1979, realistically, isn't that long ago. The vision was set. Things like operational response to incidents, whether it's fire or other events, had to be developed quickly to keep up with emerging technology and improvements. What are the key challenges we, we sort of face in, in Dubai at the moment? Well, the urban population is going to be heading towards 8 million by 2020. Average growth of 2.3 between 2010 to 2020. And this will certainly impact on our resources, certainly from the design community we're seeing this. And it's, it's good to focus in on the Expo 2020. Again, what a great opportunity to bring innovation and new systems into the marketplace to make Dubai a safer place. And I think very importantly, you know, this, this speaks a thousand words to me. I've mentioned 1979 with one high-rise tower. We've seen the downtown development, we've seen the canal development, all fantastic engineering. But look where Dubai sits as a city brand. And this was um, 2015, so this is almost two years outdated. Look at the cities that Dubai has competed against and has been voted one of the, well, it's in the top 10 brand, and it's probably moving up the scale. But we're competing with Las Vegas, San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York City, big international names, but Dubai is now on the world map. So looking at fire engineering, you know, I sit in the fire engineering camp and obviously within the Institution of Fire Engineers, but what actually do we do and what is fire engineering? Well, in essence, it's the application of scientific and engineering principles, rules, and expert judgment. We can bring things to the table that may not be considered by operational responders. We can base our understanding on the effects of fire and the reaction and behavior of people 
to a fire event. I was uh, in a building the other day on the 16th floor with a colleague, and we had to evacuate the building. Walking down 16 flights of stairs is, is no mean task. And I think as the buildings get taller, we need to fully embrace the infrastructure within a building. One critical failure, whether it's a, um, an asset of a lift, power supply, can fully impact on the, uh, the fire strategy. And we protect people, property, and the environment against the dramatic effects of fire. But we also need to consider how we can protect the responders from civil defense. Quite often, the operational firefighters do get forgotten about in the overall design process. So looking at the building life cycle within fire engineering, we see the vision, we see the design, a new building is required. We then move through to the building and the uh, construction and refurbishment phase, because there's a lot of buildings, once they've reached their end of life cycle, they'll be demolished and a new building will come along, so we re-enter the cycle again. The building becomes occupied. Quite often, as a designer, an architect, and an engineer, we can walk away just prior to completion and occupation. But really, that's when some key issues come to, come to be managed. The building management is a key factor of an ongoing safe, safe society. And also, we can influence in the deconstruction and then when the cycles close, the redevelopment. So who, who do we protect? Obviously, we look at the employees within a building, the public, plant and assets quite often forgotten about, but again, very, very important. Some very, very expensive equipment within buildings. Obviously, I've mentioned the environment, but we need to look at firefighter water runoff, the pollution, etc., and sort of decontamination of buildings. But again, I've put in the brand. What we don't want to hurt is the status of the brand, Dubai number 10. So this is how we can sort of help protect the community. So I've mentioned we can have influence in the design, product specification, and performance. Again, from the last presentation with regards to nanotechnology, quite often codes and standards and test regimes can't keep up with the innovation of products. A new product can come onto the market, but there may not be a British standard test, a UL test, that this can be benchmarked against. And I think this is, as a community, oops, we, have to, um, we have to acknowledge the innovation and work with the designers and specifiers to make the building safe. We don't want to hold up innovation because there isn't a test. We have to work together. System commissioning. Once a building is fully, uh, fully built, we need to make sure that each system works correctly to make sure the building's safe. And management systems and training, again, I'll touch on this within, within auditing. I think this is one of the key factors within buildings to run safely. Decommissioning, again, the removal from a building has to be carefully considered along with the occupation. But let's look at the operational firefighting efficiency within our whole design process. I've got a slide here that summarizes a fire strategy. Now, one of the things that's uh, very good to see now is fire strategies becoming more, um, more relevant, and pretty much every project we deal with, we set the benchmark down with the fire strategy. So we're looking at the key fire safety objectives within the matrix. Life safety, absolutely critical, the people we protect. Property protection, we don't want to have damage to our buildings. We want to protect the brand. Business protection, we want to ensure that if there is an incident, operations can continue. Things get back to normal as quickly as, as, quickly as possible. And also, we are protecting the environment at the same time. Interesting enough, when we talk to stakeholders, some, some developers actually aren't too concerned with regards to protecting the property. Sometimes they have a lower standard on the property protection, but a higher standard on the asset and the process protection. Again, I've mentioned contractors in the life safety of people here. Quite often, buildings under construction, the actual workers on the site don't have full um, protection facilities in place. So we need to make sure that the systems, and quite often simple management procedures, can protect contractors on site. And our, our strategies always include a section on firefighter operations. But do we really engage with civil defense from a design team perspective and assist in the development of their operational response plans? We often 
make assumptions as designers. If we assume that civil defense will respond in a certain, fact, uh, a certain way to a building, and that is flawed, we can actually worsen the situation and actually make it dangerous for, for firefighters. When looking at innovation and sustainability in design, the one thing, again, I'm proud to be associated with is the movement forward and innovation that Dubai and the UAE is, is displaying. Some fantastic projects out there and some more fantastic projects moving forward to the Expo 2020. But as engineers, we have tools to help with demonstrating that buildings are safe. And there's an image there of an evacuation model. We can visually see how a building would be evacuated in an emergency situation. But why can't we use these models in conjunction with civil defense to create scenarios, create case studies, what if scenarios, a point for discussion. And with innovation, we have challenging materials, new things coming in, as I mentioned, like with the nanotechnology, we need to look forward and embrace these from a testing regime. The next um, couple of slides, I'll move forward quite quickly because they are very technical, um, technical subjects. But what I want to put, put over here is we can use certain tools, uh, like a radiation model. If we have a, a building with a large open spaces and we want to create some form of barrier, we can do this with fire curtains. We can do it with fixed barriers. But they may not have the insulation. So we can use radiation models to actually determine the impact of a fire. Well, why don't we feed this information back to civil defense? Because this could be critical for the fire, firefighter safety during an incident. We can also use these techniques. Next slide is to do with um, CFD modeling. We could actually use these in investigating fires. We can look at the fire load in the building. We can determine where we think the fire started. Then we can create a model and we can actually map the smoke movement and the potential heat damage through a structure. These would be great tools. We use them for design, but are we really using them to full capability of investigation. So I think within the community, that's something that we'll be looking at within the IFE. We use these tools to simulate the smoke movement in a building. We look at the tenability during an evacuation, and quite often we set it for 20 minutes. We can create um, extract rates. We can optimize cost and expenditure on plant. But again, why don't we look in consultation with civil defense to enhancing the safety. So when the firefighters are responding, why don't we look at the critical period of the next 20 minutes after the building's evacuated, that operational bridgeheads can be established, that firefighters can deploy, the incident commanders, rather than rushing into a scenario, actually can look at a building, they've been involved in the design process, they've given input into their operational response plan, and on turning up at an incident, there's a little bit of a, 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 a calm, a bit of a pause, so deployment can be done effectively. We can also use the um, CFD models to validate designs. We can look at CO within car parks. Jet fans, interestingly enough, have, have, have got a, a bit of a, a complex history, and some authorities aren't too keen on them. In Europe, they're very keen on them. Um, but again, we can actually model, depending on where we place the fire, and look at a positive, how we can optimize things like stand pipes, hose reels, the bridgeheads where civil defense can respond to in a more effective way. But again, that's almost in partnership. It's something we have to work towards as a, as a group. So with fire engineering, we have some advantages and disadvantages. I won't, won't run through these in in, in any great detail, but I think they're looking at the disadvantages, you need to have the suitably qualified and experienced personnel. And again, I think this is where recognized degree courses and ongoing um, training and accredited courses is very, very important. One, one thing that's very important as well to look at is, is recent re research and you know, within the, the nanotechnology presentation, my first thought was the enhancements with water mists. As the droplet sizes get smaller, we, we almost have a dry mist. 
that its, its ability to remove heat from the atmosphere is, 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 is very, very positive. So maybe use of water mists is an area that will be looked at in a, a lot more sort of um, detail. Looking at um, accredited training courses and organizations, there's, there's a lot of representation here in the Middle East. Obviously, I'm representing the Institution of Fire Engineers, and we do have a lot of members actually within the audience today and within civil defense. But we also have the Fire Industry Association from the UK. We have the NFPA, which is well established in the, uh, in the, in the region, the SFPE, and the AS, ASFP, who deal more with passive fire protection. But all these organizations bring a lot to the table with regards to training courses and validating courses. And I think this is, this is very, very important. To have a third party on board that can speak to deliverers, because quite often the, you know, the, the NFPA aren't actually delivering their own courses. They're doing it through uh, third party accredited um, organizations. And it's important to understand that each of these organizations has its own methodology for accreditation. And I think one of the good positives is that you know, NFPA has 74 accredited agencies uh, worldwide through the Pro, Pro Board uh, system of approval. And the first European Fire Training Academy to be given the, uh, the acknowledgement is the UK Fire Service College in Morton in the Marsh. Now, I know quite a lot of operational uh, firefighters uh, internationally have gone through the UK Fire Service College, but it's good to see that it's now got the international recognition from NFPA to deliver certain courses. The IFE as well has its own recognition service uh, for training providers, training courses, and also educational programs. We, we do run um, examination courses every year here in the Middle East. And SFPE has technical committees and task groups as well, all looking to improve safety within the region. So develop, developing operational efficiency, um, I think this is where we get into the crux of audit. We need to look at benchmarking fire service and civil defense performance, and we need to determine where we are now, where we are going, how we get there, and how we measure our progress. And as I mentioned earlier, this is what I've seen in my four years through the leadership of Dubai Civil Defense, this process. No one likes an audit. I remember when I was operational, if you knew you were going to be audited, everyone was nervous. And quite often your performance isn't as good when you're under audit conditions as it would normally. So we can look at the various types of audit. And I've tried to simplify it down into very, very high level government audit, and that can be through a specific government body, and I mentioned the Home Office uh, initiating an investigation in the UK. That's at a national level. You would also do it at a regional level, or even at a local level. Within our own design communities, we have local um, uh, design reviews. This is what I call the internal review. But you can also get a third party peer review, and this is where the accredited uh, competent people can come into an organization and give, a, give an overview. But I think one of the best ways is to actually understand your own organization. If you understand your own organization and you can review through good practice and process, then the best enhancements are made. But it's often good to bring in a third party just to give a, a, a peer review, to just point things in the right direction if there's any, uh, any glitches in the, in the, in the uh, delivery. So establishing a review and audit requirements. Now, a lot of this will actually focus on the operation on the fire ground. As I mentioned, if things are going well on the fire ground, you'll probably find that the organization, when audited, is working well in all areas with procurement, with maintenance, equipment, personnel, happy workers. If you have good, happy workers and the culture is good, generally you have a good operational uh, command structure. But we, look, we need to look at the potential risks within the operational, of the, of the operational um, remit of the fire service. Evaluate the effectiveness of current preventative and response arrangements. Look at opportunities for improvement. Look at the policies and the standards. And always check the resources meet these policies and standards. One important thing to look at, and this is one of the great things that's impressed me in, in, in Dubai, 
going from 1979 to where we are, is anticipating future growth on the operational response and the resources, which is very, very important. We're looking forward now to Expo 2020, which is coming very, very quickly. You will see all the development that's happening in Dubai, and civil defense are having to look forward to providing correct operational response. And it's, an, it's not a small task, but I think what we're seeing is a good structure in place to build upon this. We can look at uh, key performance indicators, look at current data we have within the air, and, and benchmark against this. And we can break this down, I think, into to sort of three basic ones. Operational response times. I know a lot of positive work has been done in bringing down response times in, in, uh, in Dubai. Look at the fire incidents and look at the fire-related deaths and casualties. And I think if we're getting the first two right, we're lowering, the, you know, we have good response, we're reducing the number of incidents through good firefighting practice and good design from the design community, we will see a reduction in fire-related deaths and casualties, which is very, very positive. But this needs to be, I think, a partnership within the fire engineering community and within the fire services and fire authorities. We can further break out the KPIs into five areas, prevention, protection, response times, resource allocation, and personnel. Quite often personnel do get, um, do get forgotten about. Um, in my, my service, in the fire service in the UK, when you had a, uh, an incident, if you didn't have correct manning on stations, you would see the performance from the teams drop significantly just by having one person less on a machine, the ability of a team to respond to a fire was severely hampered, particularly if you're using things like breathing apparatus and deploying fire hoses. You need to get the safe systems of work in place. And I think this is where, from the engineering design, if officers can turn up a building and know that the protection is there inherently in the building, it gives them that little bit more of an opportunity to uh, tactically engage in the building. Looking at operational efficiencies, um, it builds down, I think, to the three phases at the bottom of the slide. But we also need to consider the training and equipment key aspects. So I introduced the Incident Command System, the ICS. I think this will benchmark how well the organization is performing. Look at the Incident Command training, and most critically, the implementation of the ICS at an incident. Ultimately, how you perform on the fire ground, and this is for all fire authorities around the world, is seen in the public eye. A good job is done, fantastic, but to do a good job, there's a lot that happens behind the scenes building up to that incident. If we never have a fire again in any building around the world, we will still need to maintain an efficient operational fire service to respond to a fire and possibly a, another incident. So looking at the uh, outcome from a, a, a complete review, we get a full picture of the operational capability. We can look at an improvement plan incorporating accredited training. We need to ensure that the personnel are getting the best training available. And we need to ensure that appropriate procedures and equipment to support multi-agency activities are accounted for. Around the world, certainly terrorism is getting high profile, flooding, in the UK, there's been a lot of incidents where traditionally the fire services have had to treat that as a special service. Now it's becoming mainstream national resilience that needs to be implemented. And we need to sort of look at the improvement over an agreed time frame. Improvements don't happen overnight. Once the policies have been set, we can incrementally see the improvements. And again, this is where the audits and the KPIs can assist us see the improvements in, in place. And when we look at the outcomes, faster deployment, everyone knowing what their role and responsibility is and that they've been trained in it. More effective operations, we've got the biggest operational effect with limited resources. Less structural and property loss, more efficient firefighting response, and safe, safer operations with enhanced safe systems of work. So looking at the incident commands system, we can have broken this down into bite-sized chunks. Compare the expectation and delivery of localized policy and guidelines. Review the incident command structure in terms of organization of the fire ground. Arrangements for delivering the training and development and ensuring the maintenance of competencies. Again, it's very important that once someone is trained in a specific field, 
it's an ongoing process of these competencies being retained. And I think that, that was sort of highlighted in the, the very first presentation from IDG. Looking at the configuration and how the service deploys its resources to incidents, correct implementation on the fire ground can actually make or break. The first decision at an incident can be the most critical one. If the first decision is wrong, quite often it's very difficult to pull the incident back from that first, first decision. That's why I said at the start, it's, it's good to know how buildings are actually constructed so you can have confidence to buy time to fully understand how you will deploy. And we need suitably, uh, the, the, we need to look at the suitability of gold arrangements in supporting the incident command structure and meeting the operational demand. We need to consider the provision of equipment and resources which immediately impact on the establishment of the effective incident, incident command. Um, knowing the full portfolio of equipment within an organization and making sure it's maintained and is ready and available for use is, is very important. And all personnel need to be f familiar with that equipment. If new equipment is introduced, then the training needs to be thought out months, up to a year before the new equipment coming in. Even down to things like tabards and personal uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, the correct designation of incident commanders wearing a tabard become visibly recognizable to all the firefighters on the fire ground. They can see, without any decisions being made, they can visually see the, the command structure on the fire ground. Again, a small thing, but very important. And we need to ensure that we review, review the provisions of the commanders, looking at the, the training, in, having the competencies, looking at the frequency of assessment and their performance at uh, incidents. The phase two that I think is very important is looking at the, the incident command training. Again, I'm, I'm running quite tight on time, so I'll just talk about the top four branches, the acquisition and maintenance of the incident command competencies. I've talked about that already, but it's always an evolving process. New techniques, new research comes into the market, and we need to be abreast of this. We need to look at the quality of the internal assessment within an organization. We need to address development needs and underperformance. If we do have underperformance within a team, that needs to be addressed, and it could be just through enhanced training. And the process for quality assurance of the external training, and this is where the accredited course is. There is a degree of confidence knowing that the courses have been accredited by a third party when, when being procured. And looking at the last slide, I've tried to involve this round. This is, this is where it really, really happens, is on the fire ground. The implementation of the incident command system. We can look at the use of the command vehicles, the management of the incident, how the sectorization, including breathing apparatus control, is implemented. The, the functionality of the officers, have the right resources been put onto... Uh, onto the fire ground. Application of the processes were on the fire ground. And looking at the resilience of the resources and the contingency arrangements, if we have an incident that is protracted for several days, have we got the right manpower on the fire ground to support the operations? The initial attack may be very, very effective, but it's holding the, effectively like holding the fort. If we don't have the, the resources that back up the first attack, then the fire could develop and could worsen, particularly if it's a deep-seated fire, an underground fire. And I'm right on 15 seconds left. I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I will be around for any, if anyone wants to catch me and discuss any of the items that I've raised. I'm more than happy to, but many thanks.